Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we are talking about the renal system, and this is lecture part one. First, a little overview about renal physiology. Usually when we talk about drugs that affect the, ki the kidneys and the renal system, we are administering diuretics for patients who are fluid overloaded. Fluid overload simply means that a patient's salt and water intake exceeds their losses and excretion of fluid. Patients can be fluid overloaded throughout their body or in just one compartment, like pulmonary edema in the lungs. The word edema simply means when fluid has passed from the vasculature into an interstitial space. And this include, again, whole body or just one compartment, like the lungs or the lower extremities, for example. Examples of things that cause fluid overload include congestive heart failure, renal failure, and cirrhosis. Fluid overloaded, overload can be treated or even prevented by restricting fluid administration to the patient. But in some cases, the patient may need diuresis, or in the case of renal failure, dialysis. A quick review of renal anatomy and physiology. Blood flows into a thing called the glomerulus via the afferent arterioles. So blood comes from the renal artery into these arterioles and splits into capillaries, and the capillaries exist in this glomerulus. From here, blood uh, is filtered, and certain different solutes are filtered from the blood into the lumen of the renal tubule. Afterwards, certain substances like water and various solutes, especially sodium, are reabsorbed from the renal tubule back into the kidney and then into the circulation again. And these things occur at various points along the anatomy of the renal tubule. So this is one renal tubule. If you look here, this is a more anatomic picture of the renal tubule. Again, with a single nephron here, blood coming in, branching off, eventually making a glomerulus, going through the renal tubule, and then the rest of the blood continuing through the renal artery. Uh, urine being collected and going into the center of the kidney. And then this nephron has been zoomed in, but you can see how the nephron uh, fits into the entire structure of the kidney, where there are millions and millions of nephrons, each one filtering blood and creating urine. And the urine all eventually dumps into this calyx, and the calyx leads towards the ureter. Meanwhile, we see the original renal artery, which branches into the arterioles and then to the glomeruli, and the renal veins, which take the return blood which has been filtered and returned to make the renal vein. It's very important to remember that sodium is mostly reabsorbed from the kidney isotonically. And what this means is that as sodium is transported from the renal tubule back into the body, water follows the movement of sodium. So we don't develop a lot of hypernatremia. We don't develop high sodium concentrations because as sodium moves, water follows it. And it's very important to remember that in general, Water follows the sodium because it is the predominant electrolyte in the circulation. What this means is that the fina, the fractional excretion of sodium, that is, what percent of your body's sodium is actually secreted, it's much less than 1%. Your body is designed to hold on to sodium as much as possible because that's how it holds on to water. So the sodium may be filtered into the renal tubule, but then it's reabsorbed throughout the renal tubule. And this is where diuretics are going to work because when the diuretic prevents absorption of sodium, it thereby prevents retention of water. And so as the patient loses sodium, they lose water along with it, and that leads to the diuresis. As an aside, if the diuretic can't get into the renal tubule, then it can't work on those channels, and it can't prevent the reabsorption of water. An example of this would be patients who have renal failure, because there's no longer any filtration of substances, including diuretics, into the kidney. So that's a real quick overview of renal physiology. If you have any pressing questions, please let me know. But hopefully that gives us enough of a foundation that we can talk about some of the renal drugs that are in this week's unit. The first drug we're going to talk about is really sort of a rare drug. So we'll get it out of the way first, and it does show up on some exams. Before we talk about the drug, we need to know about an important enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. 
when the kidney is functioning normally, we already said that a lot of sodium is pumped into or is filtered into the renal tubule and it needs to be pumped out so the body doesn't lose a ton of sodium. One of the ways this happens is in the proximal tubule, there is a sodium hydrogen ion pump. So sodium leaves the tubule and hydrogen ion comes in to replace it. Meanwhile, bicarbonate is filtered into the urine at the glomerulus. Now, filtering all that bicarb into the urine is a problem because if the body loses a lot of bicarb, it becomes acidotic. So under normal conditions, the body has a way to deal with this and it's called using the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. The hydrogen ion and the bicarb come together to form carbonic acid and the enzyme carbonic anhydrase takes the carbonic acid and converts it into water and CO2, which can then be absorbed back into the body. This is how the system functions normally. The medication acetazolamide, or diamox, is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. And if we look back at our equation on the previous slide, when we inhibit this enzyme, the whole equation starts to back up. And as we develop more and more bicarb and hydrogen ion building up, the pump that exchanges sodium for hydrogen ion reverses. And now we will have less ability to pump sodium out of the renal tubule because there isn't enough room, so to speak, for hydrogen ion to come into the tubule because this equation is backed up once the carbonic anhydrase enzyme is blocked. So what do we have now? We have urine that still has a lot of bicarb in it because that's filtered at the glomerulus, but instead of having a lot of hydrogen ion, it has a lot of sodium ion. So what's going to happen to patients who get carbonic anhydrase inhibitors like Diamox? They're going to have an excess of bicarbonate ion on their urine without hydrogen ion to balance it out. And they're going to have excess sodium in their urine because it can't be pumped out in exchange for hydrogen ion and that's going to lead to diuresis. So the sodium brings water out, bicarbonate also goes out, and we have an alkaline urine and a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Acetazolamide is used for a number of different indications. It can be used to treat moderate to severe metabolic alkalosis. It's commonly used in the treatment of altitude sickness. It has been used as a diuretic for patients in heart failure. And we also find it used for a variety of other diseases, including glaucoma, epilepsy, pseudotumor cerebri, central sleep apnea. And some of these treatments may be due to the ability of acetazolamide to decrease the formation of cerebrospinal fluid and aqueous humor, which is the fluid in the eye. Acetazolamide technically can have a cross sensitivity with sulfa allergy and so you should use caution in those patients. Take a moment to review that and see if you have any questions. Again, this is an uncommon drug that you may not be exposed to um, rarely, if at all, so we really just want to highlight the key points here. The last diuretic we're going to talk about in this video is an osmotic diuretic called mannitol. Mannitol is an interesting substance. It's a kind of a sugar. It is freely filtered at the glomerulus into the renal tubule, and it's poorly reabsorbed. So all of the water reabsorption that passively occurs when water follows sodium is going to be limited because there is an osmotically active substance inside the renal tubule pulling water back in. So this re increases the osmolarity of the renal tubule. There's a second action of mannitol as well. Not only does it work in the kidneys, but it also draws water from cells into plasma by the same mechanism. By being osmotically active, it pulls water out of cells into the vasculature, and it also increases renal blood flow. So interestingly, even though mannitol is a diuretic, patients can become transiently fluid overloaded during this step right here when water is being drawn into the vasculature. And so patients could actually develop transient pulmonary edema or a dilutional hyponatremia as free water is pulled into the vasculature. But once the diuresis begins, then we would expect the patient to diurese and lose free water and become hypernatremic. 
there was always some thinking that giving mannitol and increasing renal blood flow might prevent acute injury in patients whose kidneys are at risk. This may be true in patients who are getting a renal transplant, and we do very commonly use mannitol in patients getting a renal transplant. But otherwise, there really isn't very much evidence to show that mannitol confers any renal protection. So you may see patients having major vascular surgery like aorto bifem or aortic, um, a high aortic cross clamp surgery. And there really isn't a lot of data that shows that the kidneys do any better when mannitol is on board, although you may still see the practice being commonly used. Mannitol can also decrease intracranial pressure and is used very commonly in neuro cases where we want to uh, decrease cerebral blood flow and decrease ICP to make the brain softer and easier for the surgeons to manipulate. And similarly, it can decrease intraocular pressure. An important clinical point is that when mannitol extravasates out of a vein, it can cause a significant tissue injury as the extravascular compartment draws in water and fills up. And something like a hand or an arm can become very tight and actually lead to tissue injury and compartment syndrome. So you need to be very careful with mannitol to always give it through a central line or else through a free-flowing um, vein that you're able to observe for any signs of complication. A typical dosage of mannitol is somewhere between 0.25 and 1 gram per kilogram. Usually I give it over about 15 to 30 minutes, but it can be given faster if necessary. That's the end of this recording. Please let me know if you have any questions, and we'll see you in the next video.